Um, I am Patricia Tomlinson. I am the curator of the Appleton Museum of Art, and I want to welcome you to the final installment of our Artists Outlook virtual series. We've done these for actually, I think, a little over a year now, and we've been highlighting artists that are either part of our permanent collection or exhibiting at the museum when I interview them, or both in Susan Martin's case. And um, we're thrilled to have her here. She is a renowned Florida artist, extremely productive. And uh, Susan, would you like to just say a little bit about yourself before we begin? Well, um, I have lived in Florida for quite some time. Um, I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, uh, painted and drawn all my life. And uh, it seemed a natural progression, although when I, I I was thinking this kind of interview makes you think about your life a little bit and what other people, how they view it. But when I first went to college, they said, okay, what are you going to major in? And I said, I thought that's why you went to college. You got to try things out. I said, I have no idea. I was totally unprepared. And, and I said, oh, oh, I'll major in art. I was always good at art. And they said, Art it is, <laughs> and it worked. I was in heaven. I love classes and so forth, but it was kind of um, not well planned. <laughs> anyway, and I have been painting and drawing ever since. So you mentioned that you were good at art. Have you been uh, painting and drawing since you were a little child or how did that kind of manifest? Yes, it was just a natural thing to do. And you know how families identify you as, okay, she's the artist. And I always did. I took lessons here and there. It was, it was nothing that was a pressure thing or, or that I did night and day, but it was something I always did. It was a way of um, recording the world, seeing the world. Um, it was just a, a natural thing to do. I think it's probably natural for a lot more children if they have access to tools. Lord knows mine did, you know, give them glue, paper, anything that they could put together and it kept them out of my paints <laughs> and <the> good brushes. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Um, now we are, we're pretty familiar with your style and we'll be looking at that in, in a few moments. But one of the things I wanted to ask you, because I find this, I really want to know the answer myself. You are known for your sort of focused botanical studies. Before, when you were younger, before you kind of chose that style did you do more broad landscapes I mean were you always kind of focusing in or did you do other things first no I when you're if you're drawing and I uh, you draw whatever is in front of you and and I didn't I was not really into gardening but I was always into wandering and natural things there was um, there were acres behind the house that I grew up in and I spent a great deal of time just wandering back there, the cat and I, and imagining fanciful uh, places in those, and then and, and looking at the wildlife. I mean, it just was, um, I had siblings, and I'm looking back, I don't know where they were. I had nothing to do with them. I was the oldest. Maybe I was escaping, I'm not sure. But uh, I spent a lot of time, wandering and natural things, observing, looking up the names of wildflowers, birds, whatever, uh, and drawing anything. But in school, um, I drew everything. I have I actually have a huge series on totally different topics, uh, subject matter. I, I did, uh, it's only really about the last I don't know how many years, eight years or so that I went back to botanicals. I did a whole series on recycled things. I went to, to the recycle yard where they had paper and plastic and bright shiny cans. And I did a zillion uh, paintings of those. Not many people wanted them over their sofas, but... Uh, <laughs> which was discouraging, but they were beautiful paintings and I've got them over myself. <laughs> but 
because I didn't sell many, but but they were they were really done in much the same style, which is is kind of abstract abstracting the subject matter and looking at it as, as a composition. So whether and then I did a series on the junkyard, old cars and rusty things, but up close, the same thing where you're very up close and so that it almost becomes a different thing. Yes, it's recognizable. But without the background, without the context, you can look at the lines and shapes and the design of it rather than purely what it is. So the subject matter is really an excuse to put together a design that's pleasing, that has color, that has form and movement throughout it and so forth. Um, I am a gardener, but that's not, I'll paint anything. But it, things do develop in series. So I, I probably did a dozen big paintings of, of cans, bright, shiny cans, squashed cans, whole cans, paper stacked, all kinds of cardboard, glass, broken glass. Oh, it was wonderful. And <laughs> you want any? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, maybe I, we'll I, talk after. <laughs> So the, the subject matter is just an excuse for that series, that way of thinking. It, it, the, my painting is, style is exactly the same um, as earlier. Okay, okay. So let's kind of talk about some of your influences. Um, I know one individual whom I'm sure you'll mention was a big influence, but what about prior to him? Did you have other artists I mean, because you're a painter and a big influence as a photographer, but let's back up a little further. Did you have other painters that you that were big influences on you? My mother had prints. For, I don't know. My mother was not into art. I have no idea where, why she had these prints. Maybe the architect had persuaded her to. It's a very contemporary house. Uh, and I, it's, it's like anything you have around the house, at least for me, I absorbed those paintings. I remember staring at those paintings, Picasso, Van Gogh, and so forth, for hours and hours, and at magazines and books and so forth, just trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, so there was an awareness of art, uh, but it wasn't a particular artist. And then when we moved to Florida, to Melbourne, there was not much going on here. There were artists, uh, but there was real. There was no museum. There was, there were no real strong influences around me. It was kind of a void. I mean, not putting down the. I, I made friends with fellow artists and so forth, but there weren't a lot of resources early on. We moved here in '69, I think. So, it there was a Sears. And there was a discount store. That was it. <laughs> okay. So then let's fast forward to your very interesting influence from a photographer, even though you're a painter. I know. I mean, I had some some wonderful painter in painting instructors, but no one I one I fought with the whole time because he had a very different concept, which actually is what I've gone to. He, he used to tell me that um, you had to be able to envision the finished product before you ever started. And at the time, I hate to give away, but I am old and I, the, you know, this was the seventies and broad expressionist, very loose work and that's what everybody was doing that was the influence at the time and that's what students did and of course it couldn't be predicted so I fought with him at some expense <laughs> and then it turns out after years and years that I'm kind of back because now I have to have my work planned out before I ever began uh, to pick up a brush um, but um then, then I graduated. My husband was still in um, uh, working on his uh, degrees, and uh, so we stayed around. And so I got a, a teaching certificate, which had the effect, even though people, the um, 
students, the art students made fun of the art education people, okay? <laughs> they did. But it was the first time anyone had ever given me a vocabulary, uh, an art vocabulary. I don't know how I got through four years of college with a major in painting without a vocabulary, but no one ever brought one up. And uh, we had to, if you're going to teach, you have to use words and you have to have a vocabulary that describes these things and these deep feelings and also don't do the trick when you have a room full of kids. And so that was a very positive thing. And then the other was I had extra time to take courses. So I took um, photography from a brand new professor who had just joined the faculty and Russell Lee. And he was an extremely well-known photographer with the WPA, Work Progress Administration, and a very interesting person. It didn't affect my painting at the time, but years later, I realized that some of his influences about what made a good photograph, the contrast, the deep velvety darks, the gradations, uh, the composition, because we started out with those great big um, tripod, four by five, you know, things you had to lug around with all your might. And uh, in, of course, in black and white, never touched anything else and, and printed our own stuff. You know. I remember the very first day in class, he said, okay, he showed us how to use the cameras. And he said, go out in the yard, which was nothing but straggly grass and a few mesquite trees. And he said, and take some pictures and bring them back. And I took pictures of a pile of rocks. They weren't even interesting rocks, just really ordinary rocks. It was all I could find. But once I saw them through the lens in black and white and got real close, I began to see a composition and I got so excited. Now, when I took them back to the class and they were critiqued, nobody else was very excited about my, about my composition, but it changed everything. I was a believer from that second on because in black and white, you just can't fake it. Pretty colors, subject matter, nothing can rescue you. If the composition doesn't work, it doesn't. And that and, and the darks and the range of, of, of values um, and absolutely nothing corny or stereotypical was allowed. I mean, he was a very gentle man and his students adored him, but he had very strong ideas as well. And after I left the university and we moved to Florida and I was on my own, really almost without any influences. Very gradually, I noticed that my real loose brushwork began to solidify and it became sharper and cleaner and cleaner. And I wasn't even aware of it until the one of the paintings that you have was purchased by the Fusner. And it was after the very first uh, artist form art show. The artist form was an art, a group of artists that were formed as an association with the museum. And um, I won the best of show. Shocked. And they purchased it. And um, I, I, I had a show associated with it. And so I brought in all of the paintings that I could beg and borrow and so forth. And I put them in chronological order and I saw the first ones, they were no longer real brushy, but still they went from soft to very sharp and clean. And I, I had not seen it. It was, you know, one of those mouth opening <laughs> events. I, I don't know if anybody else saw, but it, I had not realized. How, and, and it was those things they just, they inserted in your brain and it just, looking for the clean, the sharp, the deep values, the, the contrast and the composition above all. And I've taken a lot of composition classes, but rushy all over the kind of things. And this was, it was a different thing. And it, it obviously affected me, but, but it was a surprise of sorts.
I, th I think that's really interesting how it was sort of a almost unnoticeably gradual progression. I find that really fascinating. Thank you for that story. Well, I was in, in isolation in many ways because there, well, there were no classes, there were no, it was just me painting and read, you know, and any subject matter, friends posed or planning, painted a bush or a house or a beach scene or whatever, but it moved on its own anyway. Sometimes we're not aware of those influences, but he, and he died before I went back to, to contact him, but he was dead. Oh. Didn't ever get to tell him what an influence he had on my life. Oh, well, that's, that's a lovely story. And yeah. well, the, and the, you're very, the word I would use for your art is precise. You're very precise and you have a lot of precision in your work. So why don't we actually move to the slides and we okay. can start looking at your art. Let me share the screen here. So, okay, so the first one we have up is mosaic, a very large piece. It, this is from, um, maybe nobody cares, but it was uh, from a photograph that I took at the Botanical Gardens in Gainesville. And this is not even a fourth of the image, but I take a lot of photographs and work my photographs kind of like sketchbooks because they're information that I can take back and play with and compose from. So this turned out, I did go back years later and, and I was giving a talk and so I compared the finish, the painting uh, image with the original image I had taken and it's just a little corner of it. But anyway, I love the way the, uh, the diagonals coming from two corners, uh, crossing in the middle, although they're somewhat subtle and they, and they and all the branches break up the leaves and all the patterns behind them into these small pieces, which is why I named it mosaic. Um, it, uh, every time I would paint, because I would paint just a little shape. If you could look up close and anybody goes to see it, you'll see there are all these zillions of little tiny shapes and each one is painted by itself because it's isolated oftentimes by limbs and so forth. <clears throat> Incidentally, I, I, when I finished it, I, everybody kept asking what that tree was. Then I sent it back to the um, sent a image of the painting to the director of that botanical garden. And he wrote me a two page letter about the history of this tree. <laughs> he never said he liked the painting. <laughs> I didn't send it to her, but I thought that was funny. <laughs> and, and it's um, um, a, some kind of buckeye and it, um, how it uh, provides flowers that, that uh, the hummingbirds depend on. They just love in the spring and later on the fruit and so forth. And, and this long story, two pages more. <laughs> and, and, and then he said goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> But I love this painting. I really do. I don't, because I yeah. like all those bits and pieces. It, it's glorious. And another question that comes to mind um, when I see this on screen and, of course, in person as well. Um, so these beautiful, bright pops of color. Now, we're, I want to ask about your process with, now you take photographs, but do you ever add your own touches or do you literally paint from the photograph? So for example, was this bright pop of color really that in the photo? Was, that was there because I compose with those things in mind. Okay. If you could see the whole image from which that came, I selected. I have on occasion combined more than one photograph. And occasionally when I have to add another thing to a, a composition, it's really because I have miscalculated. It's, it's because I made a mistake and I didn't, didn't compose it well to begin with. Um, I, 
I love the search. The search is wonderful. It's so much fun. I started last night because I'm almost finished with this other painting and I can't stand the thought of not having something to get up and work on. So just looking through and, and what if you took this and made it a vertical? Uh, what if it was a square? What if I moved it over and included this? And so I, this is the creative part of my process. This is, this, I know what it's going to look like. And I spend hours and hours and hours. Uh, I, it's not something you can track. You don't know how long you spend. But this is the most creative part. Yes, painting, you make decisions, but they are smaller decisions. And then I paint the whole thing. And then I go back and pull up parts and push other parts back, maybe make something brighter or sharper or softer or whatever. So there are other creative decisions, but by far, this is the most important when it, the composition before I ever began. You can't just say, well, let's move that branch over three inches. <laughs> it's a lot of work to move that branch over three inches. So, so generally, they, I, may, I may exaggerate those orange bits and so forth, because they're important to pop throughout the composition. But then usually it's suggested. It's what you choose to pull up or push back that um, helps the composition. Okay, okay. Moving to the next one, the way in, the way out. And this is a one, this one's great fun. It, one can get very lost in this painting. I've stood <laughs> in front of it for a while. <laughs> well, I'm glad you feel that way. Um, <laughs> It, th this was actually a photograph that I took in Nice and there was a big plaza and they had a huge area of these plants and I was struck the moment I saw it because you have on one hand you have these sharp rigid green and white that you know seem to be a counter personalities to these floppy pink flop over kind of things and then all the little undergrowth the photographs never show well the little underneath, which I always like, but I, I like the warring aspect of this. Um, and there were so many of them to choose from. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> Not what most people would remember Nice for, but. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the movement, because it's just genius how one's eye just, incessantly is floating around this camp because you're following you know the leaf and then you're going up that one and then you're it's really great fun it's, yeah, it's very interactive coming actually. down from the top yeah it's very <laughs> interactive and that's half the fun it well it was fun it it was a long time deciding exactly where to crop it and, but i love the subject matter instantly but how to make it into a painting it's a whole different thing it's great Okay, so let's look at another one. And this one, every single solitary person who has seen this that I have been around when they've seen it thus far has literally gasped when they see this because they can't believe it's not a photograph. They can't believe it. Well, it's not, the, it, you know, when people say that, I understand because it's very recognizable. And, and when you, when one paints it, I try to bring out characteristics that are, desirable but it it anyway it was a, it was a plan in some botanical garden in Sweden I think I don't know where it was but I love these huge leaves and obviously when they unfold they're crinkly and then they kind of flatten out later on and then it has this momentous whatever it is uh, that comes is coming out and that's why I named it now arriving and it's like you know this is the big moment but I love the and, and again it doesn't show it really uh, only shows in the painting the way you have it well lit in the museum all the little undergrowth because I always look at these plants and imagine what it would be like to be very small and in and among this, and what it must look like. We see everything looking down, but uh, what insects and mice and so forth see, it's, it's another world. And I like to pull that up and play with it to encounter to the 
big monumental leaves and so forth. Mm -hmm. But they were fun to paint, that all those crinkly things. But I have to count over. Okay, I'm on wrinkle this three over because you lose your place. <laughs> you know, what was that doing? It's, it's wonderful. It's a great piece. And this is a very small. So we go from the bigger to the smaller with clutch. Scale is important because this was an intimate thing. It, when I, it's just a little tomato plant uh, that I passed every day and finally took a picture of. And I liked the way the leaves look so protective, like a nest of, with eggs beneath it. Um, and uh, yeah, I played with the colors and so forth, but on a large scale, this wouldn't have worked. It was that intimacy. And so it's, um, I think, yeah, 20 by 20. I don't know what that purple thing is in case anybody asked, but it seemed important to the composition. So I left it in, but I love tomatoes. I've done a lot of tomatoes actually. <laughs> No, I think the purple really adds to it because I think it would be an entirely different painting without it entirely. And I, I don't know if it was a steak or some other growth underneath, but you know, that's not for me to question. And again, I cropped this down from a much larger plant, but, um, and then played so that the, the leaves were so dramatic because they had to fight that, that orange. If the leaves hadn't had a, somewhat dramatic texture, then they couldn't have balanced with the, uh, the richness of that red orange color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the sentinel, <laughs> sentinel. <laughs> thou shalt not pass. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't pick these things out as stories, but they just kind of happen. And I, uh, I was traveling with some artists in Sicily and we stayed on this farm. They have farms where you can stay and, and then roam the farms and everything. And I was looking for some subject matter. And I came to a field where they had harvested artichokes and they were long gone. But I found this one plant and it, just rose above the others as if it had known something special and survived and it was on and they grow kind of crooked anyway on the side of the stem they don't grow up as I would have expected and then they have those beautiful blue thistles inside them but and I took so many photographs but I didn't want the obvious blue because it's so rich that it just, that's all you would see and, and the rust of the, the textures and so forth. This is the exception to the rule. Usually I have no background and I don't want background because I want to zero in. But in this case, it was integral to the, this aspect of the, the surviving artichoke and just a hint of that blue so that you wanted to see more but it was hard to give it up. It's such a luscious blue, it's just beautiful. But it, you know, obviously it had passed its prime and somehow gotten out, you know, never been harvested. It's wonderful, <laughs> the last man standing. <laughs> yes, it was. So let me ask you this, you clearly travel around, you take photos as you are traveling. Is there one place you found in the world that seems particularly good and rich for this, for your pho photographic explorations that can become paintings? No, they're just, if you look and we spend a lot of time in museums, I travel with other artists, but we, there's always time to, to wander. We don't laze around, these are exhausting. <laughs> travels we don't give them a minute we, it's it and there's France was gosh I got so many images from France and it's just so lush Sicily maybe if we'd gone slower it was a fabulous place to go and so many images but it was one of our first trips and we went way too many places and spent a lot of time lost because we were in our own car we went the whole way around Sicily uh, <laughs> without speaking the language, <laughs> not very much. Uh, anyway, uh, no, 
and there's so many more, I don't think, I think any place is what you, I have painted every plant on this property in my neighbor's properties. There's things there. You just have to, you have to have time. And a lot of times there's just not time to get a photograph. And that's why I take so many because I don't have time to really, especially if you're with anybody else, you just take the photographs and come home and throw out most of them and very few really are productive. But seeing a different part of the country and getting out of your old comfort zone, you do look at things a little differently. And there's, I've gotten, I've done a lot of paintings from these travels, but I've done even more from my own backyard. <laughs> it's more convenient. <laughs> So let's look at oh and this this one oh this on the wall this one just cannot be beat it is just oh, spectacular it was kind of a surprise because i this image i looked at a long time before i painted it and again i had several but it was a uh a, rect, a horizontal rectangle but i i, I just all I could, it had emphasized these rows, which I liked, but you just tended to, to see the rows and rows and rows. And so finally I cropped it into the square and suddenly the, the emphasis became down underneath all those in that dark area, which was really fun. And, and I hadn't realized that those little flowers and so forth that's why I called it the interlopers. I don't think they were the crop. I have no idea what this crop was, but I think it was a crop. Uh, and they just appeared. I had no idea. And anyway, that's one that just took a long time to, to, to crop, to work into something that worked. I mean, I had to cut off the top of that because otherwise it was just about that white flowering plant. I didn't want it to be. I wanted it to be a part of this whole thing. Anyway, and I, and I wanted to emphasize those darks, as I said, underneath the leaves. Mm -hmm. And I, you've got, I see grass po poking up right here. Yeah, yeah, little the things you never expect. And, and if, if you are taking photographs and emphasizing those of the plants, you don't have time to see all these other things that appear. And then sometimes they don't appear. <laughs> There's a lot of things that don't work, but... Um, it was a happy surprise. I don't know what they are. I, I have no idea what that plant is. But I may like have it. to Google and figure that out because now I yes. want to know. <laughs> One of the things I really love about this particular piece as well is you are clearly having a ball with texture. There is so much rich texture ping ponging off each other on this in this painting. It's just incredible. Well, you know, not everybody sees that. I'm glad you do. I, I I like the piece, but it doesn't have spectacular color. It's, it relies more on the textures and the composition. Yeah, it's it's a terrific piece. I Thank really am enjoying it. It's near my office too, which is helpful. So I can just pop right out and look at it. <laughs> and then we get yes. to the pieces that we have at the Appleton. Yes. So this is an early piece. That was the one that I said that the, I won the, the artist form best of show. And that was one of the early Crotons. And I like the Crotons because they change um, from the bottom leaf of the plant to the top leaf. They're, they're different colors, they're different shapes. The new leaves, you know, come out one color and then they gradually change and then no two leaves are the same anyway. And so they're always a wealth of information. Um, but it was also a turning point when I had to, I used to draw from life all my paintings, but when I began doing uh, something like this, I could draw it all out. And by the time I finished it on the canvas, much less paint it, uh, the leaves had turned, they followed the sun, some of them flopped over. Uh, and I remember the day I was drawing a croton with my back up against a thorny bush and 
I got to the end of it and I looked and the whole plan had changed. Followed the sun, everything had changed. And I said, okay, that does it. I'm going, I went and got my camera. And that's why I use the camera because it takes me usually months to do a painting and there, nothing is going to stand still or be the same or the light, the leaves, the growth, anything. So I am use my images. One of the things I really find interesting about this piece too is you've also done a series. Is it an actual series of the single blooms that you've done as well? Oh, I, what are you, you saying? One like there's an iris and some other, oh. it's mostly the singular blossom. Um, I've never thought about it. This reminds me, it's, it's like you've come full circle because this to me is this like floral explosion, blam sent mm -hmm. in the middle of the picture plane, taking the space, the background, you know, is extremely vague, of course. Mm -hmm. And, but your other pieces that you're doing remind me of this. Well, I love, still love Crotons. I, if anyone can have exhausted <laughs> Croton as subject matter, I think I'm coming close to it. I've got one on the canvas right on the <laughs> easel right now. <laughs> I, because there's so much variety in the leaves and so forth, there's, there's a lot about it and, and the lighting changes it. And I like the way the, I like, as you pointed out, the texture of the leaves uh, is so much fun to paint. It's just fun. And then you add color to it and they're all different. These are orange, these are pinks and greens. I mean, they're all different. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yep, yep, there they are. <laughs> <laughs> They're not done yet. <laughs> we can go, we can revisit that again when we get out of the slide. So let's look at our last slide. This is another one we have at the Appleton, one of our pieces now. And as you mentioned, pinks and different colors. And yeah. And you can see it expanded more uh, so that I'm cropping tighter. Mm -hmm. uh, but just add, it emphasizes oftentimes the movement, because I, I like this movement, especially this diagonal movement of things and the leaves just kind of move until your eye moves through it. That's the fun part of leaves. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's, I suppose, a narrow point of view, but I did like this one. And, and uh, this was also, of course, at the Fusner and the curator said, you know, well, this would be a good bookend for the one we have <laughs> from you earlier, so. They got that one and you got it. <laughs> it's, we love it. It's, it's a beautiful painting. Okay, so let's go back to full screen with us. So Ashley, can you swing back to that other painting that you just showed briefly? You're talking to me? Yes, in your uh, studio. It might need more light. That's okay, but see, she still loves croton, crotons. crotons. <laughs> Yeah, that's beautiful. The pinks are fun, but the greens are everything. There's it doesn't show up, of course, in this light. But anyway, yeah, I still like those plants. <laughs> well, well, you know. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. So let's talk a little bit. I've asked every single artist in the series this question, and I wanted to ask you as well. During lockdown, when we were all in our homes, it, I've been getting different artists take on it. Some artists kind of hold in and didn't really produce. Some produced like crazy. What, what, did, what did you do when you were sort of immobilized in your home by circumstances? What did you do? Painting is a solo activity. <laughs> no one else can join in. And I feel bad because some people had a tough time. It was a gift <laughs> to me. It was glorious. I didn't have to go to meetings. I didn't have to get dressed to go be decent somewhere. My day, I mean, once I'd gone to the grocery store, I was set for the week. Um, I got so much more painting done than I've ever done in my life because it was it was so focused and so i had something on the the easel 
and there was nothing, you know, once I fed my husband, I, the day was mine. And I, I got a tremendous a lot done. And I don't think I'm ever going to be able to go back to quite the interruptions that most like. I mean, I, I like to see people, but not that much. You know, I, my clothes, every article of clothing that I wore on a daily basis is covered with paint. I don't have anything that's not stained. It's terrible. <laughs> it's really awful. And I, I, right, I was trying to think of things to do before this. And I looked at the window and I realized there were, there's paint on the windows. I, I'm not a brushy wild painter anymore, but there's paint on the windows. There's paint on the floor. It's a tile floor. It's too bad. <laughs> Someday it'll be somebody else's problem. There's paint everywhere. And oh, I don't think I even remembered to get it off my hands. <laughs> uh, it was, it was, it was a wonderful time to work. And it's really, it's what every artist, I'm, I'm surprised. I did have imagery that I could work from, from years of just gathering photographs. Sometimes I had to look a little harder, but um, it, it was wonderful to have that much time to focus because in fact, coming back recently, I, a lot of stuff is going on to getting ready for Christmas. And I was only getting a couple of hours a night and I didn't like it. And I thought I've just fallen out of love with painting. And then after several days of that, finally I got back into five hours, which is, that's a good number for me. I'd be glad to go over that. But, and then I, it, it felt wonderful. It took that time to where I knew where I was it's just it's different you can't get there in two hours you, you don't get as involved with it it's it, I don't think that probably makes any sense but no, I noticed I, I thought, oh perfect. I do like painting <laughs> no it makes it makes perfect sense I think a lot of us can relate whether it's whether we like to write, whether we like to journal, whether we like to listen to beautiful music. I mean, I think it's easy to go into something and be absorbed by it. I think everybody can really Writing that. would be an ex example, a perfect example, because you have to pull your thoughts together. And this may not seem, yes, I can sit down and paint, but it's surprising that if I go away from it, uh, forced to, for you know, a week, it's like starting over. What was I doing? How was I mixing that color? How much, what was the texture of the paint? I don't know. Maybe I have a really poor memory, but it takes a while to get back in it. And yeah. it's, it's much easier if I am painting it. Five hours is a real good number for me. And I mean, five solid hours, not taking a break in the middle of it. Cause I track it. I, I, I've got my tongue <laughs> and that because then I there's no way to fake it I know how many minutes how I've spent on something and how many minutes I you know and and I go do laundry then I take that out of this <laughs> you can't fool yourself when you've written it down mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Would it be fair to say, to me, just listening to you talk, it's really fascinating. And it, I think you and I kind of think about art the same way. Would it be fair to say that you almost are dialoguing with the art that you're creating? How do you mean that? Because to me, art basically is about commu is communication from artist to viewer, but it sounds like you become so intimate with it. You're almost having a conversation with the pieces you're creating. Just even yes. the verbiage you're using. I don't know if people get that when they look at it though. And it's it was a few years ago when I was giving some talk that I described how I feel about some of the things I've painted. And it was in particular, it was a, you may have it, uh, um, something about the forest. Um, Can't see the forest for the trees? 
yes, uh, that's almost the name of it. And I was describing how it felt when you step into a forest and it's quiet and you can hear maybe bird song or rustling and so forth. And it's that stillness and that being a part of it. And they responded. And I had never talked about that before. I don't know if any of that comes across because most people just say, oh, it looks like a photograph. <laughs> but, but sometimes, and, and I don't know what I'm, if anybody relates this to mine, but when you see enough of somebody's work and you, you take time to be a part of it, I think you be, can begin, it begins to speak to you. Whether you like it or not, you kind of get, I don't know if anybody responds to mine. Um, I remember going to New York and um, there was an exhibit of Helen Frankenthaler. And I didn't particularly like her work at the time. It was the stained things, yep. but there was a lot of it. And I had nothing else to do. I was by myself and I spent a couple hours there. At the end of it, I got it. It never became my absolute favorite, but I, I began to respond to it. And so I would like it. I would be really flattered if somebody could look at it because it comes alive to me. It, the, the, the movement of leaves. Somebody else, who was it? Uh, Mark uh, Rothko. They said, oh, somebody in my class, pool class said, I don't see what they say in it. They, they see in it, you know, just a bunch of color. And I said, well, you have to get up close and you have to just let the colors work on you. And you have to begin to get those vibrations and I felt, always felt that way about Richard Diebenkorn, all those little, um, where those little edges come together and that little tiny bright red comes out. And it's just, you have to respond to it. You have to give yourself a chance. I don't know if anybody does that with mine, but I definitely, it, it was meant to be an intellectual approach. All right, that's the way I view it. It's the way I compose. But when I paint it, and sometimes when I'm photographing it, it's, yeah, it's responding to this life form that's, that's alive. It's, I don't know. No, I, I get it entirely. <laughs> well, because I got, I've got a story for you quickly, because this is really more about you, but I've got a fun story interlopers at almost every show I do I get some what I call problem children because uh -huh. they want to be the stars and they're going to fight with the other paintings and they're not going to and so sometimes I'll isolate them I'll be like fine have your own corner because you're going to be that way painting interlopers interlopers wanted to be the star everywhere I put it really? and that's why it wound up where it is because it's like girlfriend <laughs> wanted her own space <laughs> Well, I love the way you you fixed so that when you look down the length of uh, one of the hallways, whatever you're going to call them, and we'll each had a framed that framed one of the paintings, and it was so effective. It it really looked terrific, and it gave a focus from a distance that otherwise you wouldn't get. Thank you, thank you. I, I kind of like those big dramatic moments. <laughs> Yeah, they were. I'll have to notice where you put that. <laughs> I forgot where you put it. <laughs> it's, it's kind of an unsuspecting piece. The colors are kind of mild. It's not, you know, yelling at you. But she's she's tricky. She's a tricky one, though. She <laughs> she wants to be the star everywhere you put her. So okay. let's see if anyone has asked any questions. So everyone, I want you all to please uh, feel free to type your ch questions in the chat. If there's anything just listening to us talk that you wanted to ask Susan about. So let's see if anything. Here's one. Cindy asks, I saw Susan's exhibit at the Appleton on December 14th. How does she get paint colors to be so vivid and lifelike? Well, they're probably not 
really lifelike if you saw the original. <laughs> but there are many, many, many layers. And I work in acrylics. So um, the vibrant colors come from, I don't put the same color on top of one and I don't just build up the same color. Each one is a searching for the right color. And sometimes little bits are left behind because they're kind of a Deben corn effect. <laughs> but I like that little bit of blue and it doesn't matter whether it was in the photograph, but that little blue edge looks nice against the little, that darker green or whatever. And I'm build up and I'm changing. So, cause the, the paint is thin enough that it's not opaque. It's, um, I don't use medium, I just use water and thin, just kind of milk consistency. Um, and it so what shows through and where I put it, like I may put it just on one area and let the other green show or whatever, um, it builds. And then what gets left is what I like, whether it's like the painting or not. And then, as I said earlier, and then at the end of it, going back and saying, this needs to be pulled up, this needs to be pushed down, this needs to be a little sharper, this needs to be a little brighter. Uh, but it's, it's not a big thick slab of paint, it's many, many layers that build up. That's why I like the acrylics. I, I never had the patience with the oil paint. <laughs> So we have another question. Have you ret ever returned to the same garden area or plant or tree over the course of your years of painting? Well, yes, obviously. <laughs> Every croton in the area. <laughs> no croton safe. <laughs> has been painted or at least photographed. They don't all lend themselves. Crotons, yes. Um, because that I guess because I have a lot of them and they have some color I mean in in Florida we tend to have a lot of green that is it's it when it's well lit you see differences in the texture and the colors but it's still a very similar medium green so it needs something gray brown red whatever to break it it has to be broken up in some way so some plants lend themselves more uh, and, and also plants that are thick because I don't want the background to become important. I want it to be focused on these forms as if they were sculptural uh, rather than what it is, a picture of a plant. I don't care about the plant. I mean, I, I like the plant, but it's, it's not a painting of a plant. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wait, uh, Victoria asks, have you ever painted portraits or figures? And if so, how does that, I'm assuming we, by of humans, and if so, how does that compare to painting plant life? I haven't done that for so long that I, I don't know what it would be like. Um, it was, I mean, I guess I could grab a plant before I could get somebody to sit down for me. So I, I eventually went into something that I could control more than I could a model. <laughs> and I, I haven't done uh, portraits. Um, I just, you know, you eventually narrow things down. Uh, so there, I like objects, things. I like my junkyard. <laughs> but there were no people in it. I like, because they're abstract. I mean, with the people, you've got something else. Although there's some artists that, that are able to take that in a different direction, but it's not what, the way I paint. Uh, Fair enough. Um, Deb says, hi, Susan, do you have any works in progress that you would like to show us? Well, I showed you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I also have some uh, a series that I haven't shown yet, and this is not a very good example, but uh, I'm doing some shaped paintings that I cut out of board, and sometimes I put canvas on them, sometimes I don't. Um, let me see. I, I'm unhappy with this one, which is why it's not finished. Can we see some things? Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. 
and it's cut out. Wow. It's kind of fun. Uh -huh. the colors. <laughs> I, I've done, I did a whole series of shells. Wait a minute. But um, the, the trouble with them is um, when you photograph them, people don't have any idea of the scale and they like the shell could be that big. And in, in reality, they're this big. Mm -hmm. And the flowers are this big. So I don't know how to sell them to a show. I mean, you know, the, the only way I've ever managed that was one time I submitted something and I, you're not supposed to include yourself into it, but I cut off my head and held it so they would get the scale, which it was strictly a no-no, but it was the only way to emphasize. Anyway, that's, I have that kind of side thing that I do until I can get enough for an exhibit because um, I need a bunch and they're slow, but they're fun because they're flowers, they're big, mm -hmm. and they're bright. And then the croton that we just showed her. <laughs> yep. Um, Cindy also asks, um, well says first, thanks for your paint color techniques. Do you enjoy leaf me alone as much as I do? Oh, well, yes. And it, that's, that's one I never could get. There's something about those opposing colors that I never could get a, core, a good photograph of it. And I liked it. And that one has a really interesting, well, interesting to me story. Uh, I took that picture in Luxembourg and a friend of mine was just driving me around showing me the country. And um, there were these think they're just plain old Virginia creeper and they were hanging from these huge trees but instead of just being green if you got close it turned out they were reflecting the light and they were illuminated and it was like I mean they reflected it and they were they were not green anymore they were pinks and purples and all these colors and it was like magic and how it's standing in this ditch taking all these photographs. I was amazed that, that and, and yes, I, I liked painting it. I liked those colors. I really do like that painting. I, but I think she said she liked it. Yeah, she said, she's, she said, do you like it as much as she does? So she oh, really likes it. Thank you. I, I like, it was a fun painting. I mean, it was just. And that's, I'm, that's in the show. Leave me alone's in the show, I believe. I think it is. I think so too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it is. Okay, yeah. so someone else says, Hi, Susan, your detail and depth of field is extraordinary. Many of your paintings truly look like photographs. I am an amateur wildlife photographer, and occasionally some wow. will look like a painting, which is a thrill. Your exhibit at the Appleton is amazing. Have you ever tried painting insects on your plants and mushrooms? I would love to paint insects. I did once, twice, yes. Um, it's hard to, to get a good image of an insect <laughs> on something that I really want to paint. I would love to, and I'd like to do more of it. I did some crotons. <laughs> that had lizards on them at various places. My son was doing a science experiment with lizards at the time. So uh, we were collecting them. Uh, and I have some other, they're not here, uh, lizard paintings. Um, but insects are hard to get because they need to be sharp and clean. You can't put a fuzzy insect that doesn't make any sense. Um, it's a difficult thing to get. And I rely on that information. You can't, I mean, I would get all kinds. In fact, even though my images are pretty specific, I, I remember going to a show, um, I had a show and there was a botanist that was critiquing. <laughs> he knew the names of every single thing and he would have found a problem with anything that was faked or you know that was just not true to the plant even though I'm not trying to document the plant 
and I, I'll there'd be hell to pay if I made up an insect. <laughs> And praying mantids would never be on such and such a plant, so that's inaccurate. <laughs> but I'd love it. I think it'd be fabulous to have insects in it. I'll have to make a double my efforts. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so any, if anybody else has anything, they're, <laughs> they've slowed down a bit again, the questions. I have another question for you while people are thinking if they have anything else they wanted to ask. Um, we, as you know, we are a proud campus of the College of Central Florida, and as such, we have obviously students that come, and there are there is an art program. What advice would you give a, an emerging or student artist if they want to be like you, if they want to be professional artists? I would... Well, I gave this advice to, advice to my own children. They didn't take it. Uh, draw constantly. Paint in quantity. Do not get attached. You can always do better. I know we all think, oh, this is the this is the best thing I ever did. I'm not giving it away. I this is what. Paint, 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 or draw, or whatever you're doing, what other art form. Quantity. I really think you learn by just doing and doing and doing and compete because I taught for many years, uh, junior high, which was fabulous. Um, they'll do anything if you can talk them into it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, they don't have all the hangups that older students had. Don't touch it. It's perfect. Uh, and um, where was I going with this? Oh, then some some students would come back to me. They knew where I lived and so forth, and said, "I just can't get going. I just, you know, you enter a show and you will come up with something. You will produce for it. Just we all do better with deadlines. And once if you're not having enough deadlines in school or outside of school, whatever." Create your own inner shows, inner something, and you learn by getting out there. You, I don't uh, suggest listening to everything that anybody says when they're critiquing your work, but you see it compared to other people's and you see what looks finished. You see what looks consistent. You learn not by what you're told, but what you see in those competitive situations where there's a lot of work around different styles and you you take what helps and you reject the rest, but it, I think that it really helps because it forces you to get out there and look and do and produce. You can't, it can't be, it, it, if it's too comfortable, you're, you know, then you're not going anywhere. You don't, it's gotta be a, a situation where you're just driven to do it. You need to drive yourself. I mean, sometimes that's hard. I did it with crying babies and <laughs> it, you gotta work. I mean, I had to work at night when I was teaching. You just, you just make it work. You can't, it's not easy. I don't say in life is not, that being an artist is that difficult, but it's like anything that you wanna succeed at, you have to go a little bit beyond, you have to want it and you have to take some, make the time to make it happen. It's not always comfortable and easy. Excellent but. advice. Thank <laughs> you very much. So um, no one else has asked any other questions. Do you have anything else you would like to add, Susan? I would just, that in reviewing this, you know, I, I really encourage people to look carefully, not just at my work, at anybody. I mean, you have so many beautiful things at the museum. Get into it. It doesn't have to be something that's going to be your favorite. It doesn't have to be something you're going to like later on. But go look at it and immerse yourself in it. Become a part of it and see what somebody else value, why they may value it, um, why it's there. Uh, there's so many things. And then these exhibits change. It, see everything you can. I wish I had traveled more and seen more museums when I was younger. Uh, 
I don't mean as a child, but a young adult, I, I think I would have progressed more quickly had I had more information, more input. Uh, as I said, it was kind of quiet here. <laughs> But there is, of course, now with the internet, you can see so much, but seeing it in person, seeing real work in person. The first time I ever saw an El Greco, which I liked it, but, you know, before, but when I saw it in Madrid and I saw the scale and it was high, I mean, it was different. It was not what I expected and it changed change the way I thought of El Greco or anything. You have to, you have to go see real art. You don't have to like it. I, I think we, we teach people that somehow they have to like it. They have to approve of it or they have to understand it. And that, and I think that keeps some people out of museums. You don't have to like it at all. Just go see and try to figure out what it's about. Yep. What I would always tell my students, you stole the words right out of my mouth, incidentally, okay. in person, in person cannot be beat. I, I adore the virtual world. I think it's extremely helpful in a lot of ways, but a work in person is entirely different. Entirely. Yeah. yeah. And I told my students, you don't have to like works of art, but you have to tell me why. Mm -hmm. Because I taught art history and art appreciation. <laughs> it's like, you don't have to like it, but you have to have the knowledge to tell me why you don't uh -huh. like it, and then I'm fine. <laughs> and you, you, you're right. Um, Dolly was another one. I never liked Salvador Dolly, but when I saw those ten foot paintings, oh my gosh, that <laughs> it was a different world. Um, and so much of it is. It, it, it's just not an obligation to understand it, but there is an obligation to look and get close enough to let it, I think they vibrate some of them. Oh, just, yeah. Yeah. You, you respond on another level and words do help. When I was teaching, my students hated the fact that I forced vocabulary on them. I gave them vocabulary tests. Parents came in and said, why am I child flunked this test? Why are you teaching art and you're forcing them to take? If you don't have words, then you can't think. We think in words. And you have to have those words, and they really help. And I give credit to my art education classes for that because I, I never had words until that moment. I felt things, but they, and, and, and my teaching helped me understand what I was experiencing. It did a lot. It's the, you, you can't fake it with a room full of kids, especially junior high. You better say something that means something to them. And that was an eye opener. Every year working with them uh, uh, it was very meaningful. I wouldn't take that experience for anything. I did it for about 15 years. It was exhausting. They gave, took everything they could get out of you. But if you could persuade them of an idea that was worth pursuing or thinking about, they were open. And I don't know that that happens much after that age. <laughs> it's really hard. Excellent, excellent. Um, so before we sign up for the evening, I wanted to add that Susan Martin's exhibition, Garden Party, is on view at the Appleton Museum of Art in the second floor galleries dedicated to Florida artists until April 24th. So please do come. You've seen beautiful image to, images tonight, but as we both stressed, in person, it's a whole different thing. Her art is amazing. So I encourage you. Someone already asked really quickly too, Susan, does your website have other things you're going to be doing past the Appleton? Is that information available on your website? Where I'm going to be exhibiting? Um, no, but it ought to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll That's get on not, that. <laughs> I need to do that. I need to put up some places. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but in the meantime, come to the Appleton. <laughs> Yes, it's a fabulous museum. It really is. It's amazing that it's right there where you don't expect a great museum. Thank you. I mean, 
Thank you. I've, and I know people that have said they're, you know, they want to see, and they say, are you going to be there? I said, well, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> it's it's a bit of a hike for you. You're not exactly next door, and we understand yeah, that. <laughs> it's on the way to Gainesville, so I'll, I'll be in and out. Uh, yes. Well, and, and do stay tuned, everyone. In March, Susan is going to be in person giving tours of the gallery. Um, she's going to do one at 11 and one at 2 p.m. Um, I am frantically searching my data banks for the exact date. Jonah, do we have that date in March that Susan's going to be leading her tours? Forgive me, folks. I've completely, it's completely gone blank. Is it the 5th? Is it first free Saturday? I think it is. I think it's uh, Saturday, March the 5th. Susan will be in person. Um, watch our website. If, you, if you're not familiar with our Facebook, please like us on Facebook. We have lots of wonderful information about all kinds of artists. This is being recorded. The link to this will be posted on Facebook and it will also be on our YouTube channel. So we, that's a real good source of information. We're also on Instagram and we're also on Twitter. So we encourage you to follow us to really kind of stay in the know with what's going on at the Appleton. You so, have a lot going on. There is a lot going on. <laughs> We're busy, <laughs> but we like it. <laughs> so Susan, thank you so much. This has been just delightful. It has been just great speaking with you and I really appreciate it. Thank you, I enjoyed this. I did all too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much. Um, please, please keep your eye, ears to the ground and for more exciting things that are gonna be coming up virtually and in person. We're moving more towards in person. So please stay in touch with us and we look forward to having you and thank you again for being part of this. Good night. Good night.